Hello, rather than be hanging around, um, let's get to the fourth part of the EU GMP Annex 1 revision look. Oh, hello, I'm Tim Sandal, and welcome to the fourth part of the series looking at the EU GMP Annex revision and taking a consideration of what we can expect from the uh, version when it finally comes out and hits the GMP shelves. And this video is going to be looking at cleaning and disinfection. So let's get stuck in. Okay, so the first thing actually I want to pause and think about is language. So terminology has a lot to do with risk. If we're using the wrong terms and we don't fully understand what those terms are, then our prospects for mitigating risk are somewhat limited. So it's really important to make a distinction between cleaning and disinfection, as both have vastly different functions. So cleaning is the application of detergent to remove dirt, grease, protein, etc., etc., and this kind of collection of stuff that the cleaning agents designed to remove is called soiling. And this is really important because the function of disinfectants is not to remove dirt. So we need to use an appropriate detergent that's capable of doing its job to render the surface as clean as we can possibly get it and also ideally perhaps disassociate some microorganisms before we go in with a, deter a disinfectant. And the objective of the disinfectant is to kill a target number and a broad range of different species of microorganisms. So let's just get that terminology in our heads and then let's look at what Annex 1 is actually saying. So this brings us on to the key um, parts of the annex. So the annex begins with saying that to maintain clean room control, especially when people enter them, then clean rooms should be cleaned and disinfected thoroughly. And the thoroughness is based on having a written program supported with good training. And the annex also says that those undertaking this critical task should have an understanding of microbiology. And as we've already established, for disinfection to be effective, then there should be cleaning to begin with to remove the soil. And also we need to make sure there are no or at least very minimum levels of residues. So we don't want residues from a detergent remaining that could interfere with the effectiveness of a disinfectant agent or between two different disinfectants. And the point about two different disinfectants comes on to the important subject of rotation. So we should be using two different disinfectants with different modes of efficacy and different chemical formulations and together they should be able to kill the broad range of bacteria and fungi that we might find in the typical pharmaceutical clean room. But we also need to support that rotation with the periodic use of a sporicide. And how often we use a sporicide will depend upon what we're finding when we screen the types of microorganisms that we're recovering, the microbiota of the clean room. So if we're finding a rise in spores, be they fungi or bacteria, then we may need to change the balance and introduce that sporicide uh, to support the two rotational disinfectants more often. And the annex then is also saying that it's really important for disinfectants to be um, validated as well. So by validation, this is following the disinfectant requirements to evaluate different surfaces to prove that the disinfectants we're using can kill a broad range of microorganisms across a range of different surface types. And we should support that by adopting a matrix approach and looking for the most common surfaces and to ensure that we are capturing those surfaces and that's based on an approved list of building materials. And also the validation study should include a field trial 
so we're testing the disinfectants in the actual clean rooms and this gives us a opportunity to evaluate the suitableness of these disinfectants and how effective they are in the manner they use so this will allow us to capture mopping wiping spraying pre-saturated wipes triple bucket systems and so on and the annex also says that the validation must support in use expiry periods so this could be ready-made solutions in trigger sprays or what we might prepare in a bucket for example there are some other important elements as well that the annex is giving as good practice. So first of all, disinfectants used in grade A and grade B areas must be sterile. So either they're introduced, say irradiated, or they are sterile filtered. There is also the option to fumigate periodically using something like hydrogen peroxide vapour. But this needs to be carefully controlled, it needs to be properly validated and there's a lot of variables that can either make VHP work well or not work well, particularly humidity and in terms of mapping the space that is to be um, fumigated to ensure that every area is reached and every area is reached for the specific contact time. Now disinfectants used in grade C and D are not often sterile However, it is important then that they are by burden controlled and we have an understanding of whether contamination might build up in the solution, say as the active ingredient loses its efficacy or we might get a stubborn organism present. So we need to have an understanding of the bio burden that probably requires periodic bio burden monitoring. We also need to know how long we can keep our disinfectant solutions for. So not only do we need to understand how much coverage we can get out from the bucket, but when that bucket of disinfectant is put together, how long will it remain active for to a level where it still has the same level of microcidal kill? So that could be one hour, two hours, four hours, or something like that. We also need to ensure that when disinfectants arrive in a facility, they're subject to lock control and the certificate of analysis is reviewed and all the key criteria are checked. And we're also supporting that through proper vendor control, such as having a supplier audit. We also need to ensure that we have quality by design in our process. So the installation of equipment should allow the facility, the clean room, to be cleaned and disinfected effectively. So you should be able to get around all the equipment underneath it and so on. And also where we have lots of pipe work, we should be able to apply disinfectant to all areas of the pipe work. There shouldn't be any hard to reach areas. Something's very high, there should be a ladder so we can get up there. Or we shouldn't have one pipe behind another pipe. You can't quite get the wipe around it. We should have that good design principles or at least have an understanding of our weaknesses and attempt to redress those. The annex is also quite strong on where electronic devices, say smartphones or tablets, taken into clean rooms, that these can be thoroughly disinfected and the emphasis is upon um, the thorough disinfection of all services. If that renders the device inoperable then it's the wrong device going in but you've got to be able to clean and disinfect that device thoroughly. The annex also says that shoes in grade C and D areas must be regularly disinfected and able to be disinfected. This is the understanding that in a aseptic facility the shoes are always captive and then probably um, outer clean room boots are put on as well. There's also a mention for RABS, so RABS is Restricted Access Barrier System and isolators undergo sporicidal disinfection so that's really key to the maintenance of grade A control particularly because there's a manual setup activity you want to kind of make sure that all um, human derived contamination that might have been deposited into the area is effectively treated with sporicidal disinfectant and then kept in control with the application of the grade A airflow. There's also a very strong emphasis upon transfer disinfection. So the transfer of items between clean rooms of different grades should undergo the principles that the items should be multi-wrapped, so layers of wrapping can be removed through each transfer step, and a disinfection step is undertaken, which could be manual or it could be automated, such as a decontamination chamber or even going through an autoclave, for example. 
for transfer in from grade C to grade B or grade B to grade A, that always must be a sporicidal step, a validated process to show that any spore forming organisms can be eliminated. So the validation perhaps requires a level of environmental monitoring as well as understanding the efficacy of the disinfectant because we might have done a very good laboratory study but we're not entirely sure how operators will apply it, how easy it is to apply it and the thoroughness of that activity. There's also an emphasis that items that have undergone this disinfection step must be protected. And this is particularly so when going into B or into grade A, we want to have that unidirectional airflow protection to keep the items free from contamination. Because there's no point going through, say, a transfer hatch, grade A air supply, disinfection, only to take it into a grade B room and then not subjecting that item to any further controls. So these are all kind of important points that will feed in and become part of the contamination control strategy. Okay, well, thank you for watching the video. Hope it's been of interest. And next time we're going to have a look at equipment controls. So, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.